Hello, everybody. I'm Annie Brock, President and CEO of the Leader Transition Institute, and thank you for being with us here today. We are here for our monthly Learn, Do, Grow, Repeat. Today, I have a couple of guests with me. One is Jose Velasquez, and that I will introduce to you in a minute. And then we'll bring a retired Major General Greg Martin on stage with us and have a, a great conversation. I want to tell you just for a, a brief minute about the Leader Transition Institute. That will give other people just a minute to, to come on and join us. We are a 501c3 organization based in Maryland, serving globally. We do corporate and government communications and leadership training to create revenue for to produce our uh, nonprofit program, which is changing focus, moving from we to me. It is a free, virtual, hands-on, and interactive veteran, a military transition, veteran and military transition program. We offer it monthly. We provide all the resources for our participants. We welcome currently transitioning service members, military spouses, and actually veterans of any era with any kind of discharge. We uh, are not out to replace the DOD mandated transition assistance program. What we do is we fill the gaps that it creates. It solves the DOD mandated program, solves the DOD problem. We solve the, sol the service member problem. So thank you for being here with us today. These sessions are our, our monthly opportunity to continue to grow our alums and everybody else who is on with us. Today, I want to introduce to you Jose Velasquez. He retired after a 30-year Army career that included the pinnacle position of Sergeant Major for the Office of the Army of the Chief of the Army Public Affairs. His notable assignments include serving as the public affairs officer to the sergeant major of the Army, as well as serving as the Army's top digital content and broadcast expert and flagship television newscast and radio host. After his military retirement in 2020, Jose launched Velasquez Media Consulting, a communications consulting company that provides professional so social media training and strategic communications support. He also returned to an old passion, and that is radio. He hosts a weeknight evening radio show on the number one independent internet radio platform, Eagle Online Radio, and you can find him there on weeknights playing 80s and 90s music. Jose also serves as Director of Communications for the Leader Transition Institute, and we're fortunate that this year he'll be joining us for selected cohorts of Changing Focus, Moving from We to Me as a member of our teaching team. Now let me bring General Martin up on the stage with us. Major General Greg Martin is a 36-year Army combat veteran. Retired Major General, that's for those of you who aren't familiar with military rank, that's two stars. And he is a bipolar survivor and thriver, and we are grateful to have him here with us today. General Martin commanded an engineer company, a battalion, and the 130th Engineer Brigade in combat. He's a former president of the National Defense University, commandant of the Army War College, and commander of Fort Leonard Wood. He's a qualified Airborne Ranger engineer soldier and Army strategist, and he holds two master's degree and a PhD from MIT. He is a graduate of the Naval War College and the Army War College, and he is um, a graduate of West Point. His book uh, that we'll talk a little bit more about at the end of our time together, Bipolar General, My Forever War with Mental Illness, it was uh, released uh, recently, and he is an ardent mental health advocate and lives with his wife in Cocoa Beach, Florida. So thank you, General Martin, for being um, here with us today. I really appreciate that. Jose, would you shift us so that we have General Martin um, as our main, light, main um, what people see, and then um, I will ask, we'll ask the questions for the, from the side. So thank you, General Martin, um, Greg, for being here with us today I, and being willing to share your story. I, I can't help but think that the more people who hear you, the more lives you will change and possibly save. So I want to start out by asking you, what were you like growing up? Growing up, I was, uh, well, first off, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be on your show, Annie, and I really appreciate the invitation. 
But growing up, probably as far back as I can remember to at least teenage years, I was super energized, lots of drive, enthusiasm, creativity, um, problem solving skills. I was sort of the stellar standout student athlete leader in high school. Um, and then I went on to West Point and it was pretty much the same, um, you know, high achievement, high success. Then I went to Army Ranger School and same, more of the same. And then I went out in the Army as a junior officer. And again, high energy, super success, incredibly driven, focused, um, energetic. And what I found out just in the last couple of years in writing my book is that I had a condition called hyperthymia. And what hyperthymia is, it's, it's a condition in which the brain creates and distributes excessive amounts of dopamine, endorphins, and other powerful chemicals that drive me into um, excess energy, drive, enthusiasm, and so forth. And so it gave me a tremendous advantage for years and decades. And so I went slowly, year by year, decade by decade, I worked my way up the bipolar spectrum from a very low level until by my 40s, I was quite high on the bipolar spectrum and on the verge of a bipolar onset. That's right. That's really interesting. And I will say, I read your book from cover to cover. And I remember there's a part in there about where um, you talk about playing basketball, that you would play basketball for hours you practiced. Is that a part yes. as you look back now, was that evidence of what was happening? Yes, for sure. I mean, I was so ultra focused and dedicated to basketball. That's all I wanted to do. I mean, I would get up in the morning, go out on our driveway, dribble, shoot, pass, do moves uh, by myself for hours. Then I'd have something to eat and I would dribble the basketball, making, you know, offensive moves the whole way, all the way to the public basketball courts a mile away. And then I would play for four, six, eight, ten hours every day um, unless I was in school. Um, and, th and then like even on the weekends in the summertime, my family, we had a, we had a motorboat. And the family would go water skiing and I'd say, hey, mom, dad, I really want to stay home and play basketball. I need more practice. Or in the winter, they would go skiing and I would stay home and practice basketball. And that was really my life. That was a very good example of this hyperthymic, intense personality. So do you, do you suppose, I mean, I, that this isn't really addressed in the book, but it just makes me wonder, um, it is... Do you think that part of what was important about the basketball to you compared to going out with your family in the book or going skiing was that when you played basketball, you could be constantly moving? Yes, it was constantly moving. And I loved the game and the activity and the, and the, and the, uh, the flow of basketball. So playing basketball, shooting, doing layups, the running, the defense, the rebounding, the plays, the pick and rolls, the being on a team, it elevated my spirit, which was already high. It lifted me even higher. And it was kind of like runners high on steroids. And so, yeah, that was all part of it. Interesting. That's so that that's a it's interesting. And so I think that's one of the things that we, we want to think about when we are looking at people um, it, it to to know whether are they um, are they doing something like that to access it? I think that might be a cue that those of us who are lay people um, might, you know, might look at somebody and question. Um, but of course, we're not you know, we're not providers, we're, we're lay people, but just something to, to watch in, in our kids and friends and family members. Um, and I do want to mention that if you have an, anybody, if you're listening, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. And Jose is helping me uh, by keeping an eye on the chat on all our different platforms so that he can bring up the question as you have it. So Greg, how did living on the bipolar spectrum help you? It helped me by giving me all this extra energy, drive, enthusiasm, positivity, extroversion, problem solving skills. So it took whatever talents I had and boosted them, enhanced them, and made me better for years and decades. I was very, very successful. Um, 
and a lot of that was due to my natural ability. But I wouldn't have been as successful to the same degree had it not been for my hyperthymic personality, this low-level mania. It boosted me and made me better for, you know, really my whole Army career. And, um, and so you had noticeably more energy than, than your peers. Yes. And, and so how so, did, and so in like, you're a, a graduate of the Ranger school. It was that part of, did that actually help you to get through Ranger school? Absolutely. It not only helped me to get through it, the grueling, tough training where you're sleep deprived and food deprived and, and literally exhausted. It helped me to get through it with a very positive, happy, upbeat attitude, which is virtually unheard of. And, and my hyperthymic condition did that for me. Um, you know, and then as a, as a junior officer, um, I lived about four miles from the military base and I used to wake up in the morning at 4 a.m. after just three or four hours of sleep. I would do farm chores because I lived on a German farm. Then I would run to work. Then I would lead the soldiers in PT, physical training, and we'd do a killer workout, obstacle courses, push-ups, pull-ups, you know, fast running through the woods. And then I would work all morning, you know, working on maintenance, training, supply accountability, helping soldiers solve their personal problems like pay, administration, medical, and so forth. And then at lunch, I would go to the, to the gym and play basketball. And I was usually the only officer on the court and, you know, usually the only um, non-minority on the court. And so it was really awesome. I mean, really rough physical basketball. Then I'd lift weights for about 20 or 30 minutes. Then I'd finally go eat lunch. And then I'd work again in the afternoon, more of the same, all the way through till in, into the evening until I got every single task done. I never put anything off for the next day. And then when I was done, I would run home four miles through the woods, through the dark, get back to the farm, more farm chores. And then I would link up with friends and we'd go to a German restaurant. We'd eat, eat really good German food, drink beer and dance, party, sing. And then I'd finally get home to the, to the farm about midnight or so. And I would be up again three hours later to do it all over again. And that was my life, it's, it, unless, unless we were in the field doing maneuvers, that's pretty much was my life. I mean, just extraordinary energy and drive. <laughs> when I think about it, I have to say that must have been absolutely nuts. And did your, did your peers ever say to you, hey, Greg, you're making us look bad? Well, they, they never said that, that, that I was look, making them look bad. But people noticed from an early age, they, I had nicknames like the Energizer Buddy, uh, Madman Martino, Mad Martin, all kinds of names that alluded to this super level of energy. Um, and so I think people found me, uh, you know, kind of uh, unusual, um, you, you know, unique, um, a, a bit odd with my fun loving, you know, we had a saying, work hard, play hard. And I did that to the max. I mean, I worked so hard, but I played really hard too, well into the night, just about every single night. And, um, and then that idea of me being a little bit crazy, a little bit off, a little bit of an energizer bunny, it grew and grew until finally, when I went into real mania, um, it was then uh, something that was much more pronounced and said, so what caused your, your bipolar onset? What caused my bipolar onset was, first off, I had a bipolar brain. So I already had the bipolar gene from birth. I had it. And then as the years went on and I did more bipolar-like activities and had more incidents of a bipolar flavor, it was like kindling wood on a fire. So when you start a kindling fire, it's just some little twigs and then some bigger twigs and then some sticks and then some logs. And so over the years from, <laughs> from teenage years into my 40s, 
by the time I got to my 40s, there were logs that were burning on the fire. It was a real fire. But what actually caused my onset was the combination of my genetic predisposition, which was then uh, triggered by the intense stress, euphoria, thrill of combat in Iraq. So it was the combination. So in order to have an onset of bipolar, you have to, one, have the genetic predisposition, which I had, unknown, unknowingly, and then this intense stress and pressure of leading 10,000 troops in combat. And I remember when we crossed, when we attacked across the Kuwait-Iraq border, I felt like Superman. Uh, I felt bulletproof, fearless. I was all over the battlefield. I could anticipate and solve complex problems under fire before anybody else even knew there was a problem. And we had an incredibly important role for, <laughs> for the Fifth Corps to get to Baghdad. And, um, and I just reveled in the pressure and all that. But it did cause me to go into mania for most of the year um, with a few little dips into uh, forms of depression, but not that much. Um, so that was my onset. So um, I don't remember from reading the book, what I can't remember is, had your son been diagnosed with, um, with bipolar at that point, or was that after you came back from combat? Uh, they both had already been diagnosed. So um, knowing that the, um, and this is not on you, but you know, the doctors knew that there was a genetic component. They didn't say to you, hey, um, you know, this is a genetic thing. Is there something in your family? They didn't start looking at, at you um, or any uh, back in your family history to see where it might come from? Not at all. There was absolutely no discussion of the genetic aspect of bipolar disorder. And one of the things that I've learned is that that correlation between genetics and bipolar disorder was not really firmly established and recognized until uh, a number of years after um, the onset for both my two sons and myself. So I, I wouldn't really call it an a, uh, oversight on the doctor's part. I would just call it the, um, there was a lack of information and knowledge. The, the medical community just didn't know at that time. Oh, we can't know what we don't, what we don't know sometimes that's that is a part of life right. so um and so that obviously if that had been something they knew about then maybe you would have been diagnosed then but you weren't and you were misdiagnosed many times uh when you talked to healthcare providers it just in general why do you think that happened well i was diagnosed a total of six different times um, three times I had depression and I walked, I went to the doctor on my own and said, you know, I don't know what is wrong with me. I have no idea if I have some sort of, um, you know, mental challenge, but I, my personality has changed. I have gone from high energy, high interest, enthusiasm and all that to no energy, no enthusiasm, no interest. Um, isolated, introverted, um, confused, indecisive. So I, there's something wrong with me, with my brain. And so three different times I went to the doctors and told them that. And each time they said, oh, you're fine. And the types of questions they would ask me is, they'd say, well, what do you do when you're in this condition? And my answer was, well, first off, I try, to, uh, I try to get out and exercise, which is very hard when you're in a depressed, depressed state. So exercise is one of the best things you can do, but it's one of the hardest things to do when you're depressed because you're depressed and you can't do it. But I would try to do that. Uh, second, I would listen to classic, really motivational rock and roll music that would lift my spirits. Third, I would, I would recite power verses from the Bible that would lift my spirits. <laughs> and then fourth, if those didn't work, I would drink heavily. And so each time the doctor said to me, okay, um, those sound like pretty good t techniques, but you know, don't do the heavy drinking. <laughs> so they always, all three times they misdiagnosed. Later, 
after I had been fired from my job, forced to retire, and later hospitalized, I went in in a state of mania. And when you're in mania, you don't realize there's anything wrong. You think you're on top of the world. You're the smartest person in the world. I thought I held the key to world peace. I thought I was an apostle from God to fix the Department of Defense. And so I knew, I, 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 I believed I was on, on top of the world. Perfect. Superman. <laughs> and so when I went in to get um, help, the doctors, they couldn't see anything wrong with me. They, all they could see was success. Here's a senior officer has been very successful. We can't see anything wrong with him. We're having an intelligent conversation. And they didn't get any collateral information. Like they didn't get information from my wife, my family, my work colleagues. So in this case, the doctors failed to do their job properly. Because one of the things they should do <coughs> is obtain collateral information and, and sort of get a full picture of the situation. They didn't do that. And so they, they diagnosed me as fit for duty, perfectly healthy, nothing wrong. And they were to completely wrong. And the reason is, number one, I was successful. Number two, they didn't get any collateral information. Number three, nobody around me was trained on what the basic symptoms of bipolar disorder looked like. So I was around thousands, tens of thousands of people for years with bipolar disorder. <laughs> But none of them knew what bipolar disorder looked like. So when they saw me behaving in a strange way, they made no connection with the fact that I, I had a me serious mental illness. Um, the other thing is, I was a very exciting leader to be around. I was fun. We were doing big things. People liked me. I was funny. Uh, we had a good time. So people didn't want to do anything that would derail me and knock me out of a leadership role because they liked me and wanted me to be their leader. And they, would, they, weren't, they weren't willing to risk getting someone who they didn't like. So those are some of the reasons why it was never diagnosed. Interesting. So uh, it's a shame because uh, we, we make sure and we recognize and we take care of, the, of our, our underperformers. But then when somebody like you, who is a really high performer, really needs help, uh, it gets missed. That, that's a darn shame. So um, what were full-blown mania and bipolar hell like? Well, my, my, my bipolar mania continued to increase and increase year after year into my 40s. Um, my onset was in uh, 2003 <coughs> when I was 47 in the Iraq war. But for the next 12 years, my, my mania went higher and higher. My depression went lower and lower until finally in 2014, I went into full-blown mania, which means I went into a state of madness insanity. I started talking more and more, faster and faster. Meetings went on forever. Um, I had nonstop flow of, quote, good ideas. Um, oftentimes, I didn't wear my uniform. Um, I would talk for sometimes hours at a time. I went three months without sleeping. And during that time at night, when my wife and son were asleep, I would get up and go out and I would power walk all around D.C., or I'd ride my bike as fast as I could. And I would, I would ride up Capitol Hill, and then I'd ride down the hill as fast as I could, and I would hallucinate that I lifted up off the ground and I was flying over the monuments of DC. Um, that, that's just a couple examples. Um, I, I, would, I had a sense of religiosity where um, I was doing about 30 significant events, and by significant, I mean three, four, five hours long, 30 of them um, during each week across four different churches. I believed I was apostle sent by God to transform the Department of Defense. I had this grandiose sense that I was the smartest person in the world, held the key to world peace, wanted to start a university to do that. And I, act, I, I actively sought to buy Washington, D.C. real estate, which would have bankrupted us and I want to buy that out of my own pocket, my own money. Um, 
one time there was a uh, foundation board meeting and I went to give a five minute welcome and then join my family to drive to Fort Bragg or Fort Liberty to go to my son's special forces graduation. Well, I talked for more than an hour. And when I left, I went from lecture hall and classroom continuously all over the campus. I would just go in, take over, start lecturing about my views for world peace. Um, I once, and, and that went on for seven hours. So I left uh, Fort McNair in DC seven hours late. So we were late for my son's graduation. It was a terribly disruptive, inconsiderate, stupid thing to do, but I couldn't help myself because I was in full blown mania. Um, you know, I almost on multiple times, I was almost arrested by the police for behavior that they thought was bizarre and threatening. Um, and, and there were many, many more things that I could go on and, and talk about. But essentially, you know, people didn't recognize it earlier and they didn't say anything. But now people recognize my odd, you know, manic, um, insane behavior. And they gave, started writing anonymous reports to my boss, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the number one military officer in the country. And he did an assessment and decided I needed to go. So on a Friday afternoon in mid-July 2014, I got a call, report to the chairman's office at 10 a.m. So I did. And I thought in my manic mind that I was going to get promoted. And I go in the office and the first person I saw is the lawyer. And I said, OK, not getting, <laughs> not getting promoted today. And General Dempsey came across the office and he gave me a big hug. And he said, Greg, I love you like a brother, but your time at National Defense University is over. You have until 5 p.m. to resign or you're fired. And I'm ordering you to get a psychiatric evaluation at Walter Reed. You would think I might be depressed or uh, disappointed. No. I said, thank you, General Dempsey. You know, God put me here to do big things, and now he's going to put me somewhere else to do even bigger things. Interestingly, 10 years later, I am doing bigger things. My bipolar advocacy is probably the biggest thing I've ever done in my life. But from there, I, I, and then I got evaluated three times for uh, my mental health, and all three times I was given... I was given fit for duty, uh, no health problems, you're good to go. But they were just flat wrong. And from there, I went from bad to worse. I spiraled then crashed into hopeless, crippling, terrifying uh, depression and psychosis, which are hallucinations and delusions. And then finally, in November, a few months later, I went back to the doctors and said, hey, doc, I am really depressed. I can barely function as a human being. I used to be really energetic and, and driven. What's wrong with me? And this time they got a little bit of collateral information. My wife said she thought I was manic and they made the proper diagnosis that I was um, diagnosed with bipolar type one, with psychosis, with PTSD, with anxiety or disorder. But the big thing was the bipolar dis disorder type one. But then after being diagnosed, I went from bad to worse. The medications I got didn't work. They made me sleepy, did nothing for me. And then I, I continued to spiral down. Um, I lived, I moved to New Hampshire. I would, um, if, if I would, uh, typically I would just lay on a couch all day long, staring up into space, ruminating about every mistake I had ever made. Um, I had uh, hallucinations of this invisible force that wanted to grab me and throw me under an 18-wheeler truck, which would rip my arms and legs and head off. Um, another one, this force would grab and drive me head on into an oncoming truck. Um, I had visions that I was, um, people were spying on me, watching me. They would get me arrested, put in jail where I'd be beaten and then stabbed to death and die ble bleeding to death in a, uh, on a cold concrete floor, gurgling in a pool of my own blood. And um, I, had a, I had a vision every morning that a boa constrictor snake came out of the woods 
its eyes blazing, its tongue flickering, and it would wrap itself around me and crush the life out of me, leaving me incapacitated. So with all of that, I was finally admitted to a VA hospital in White River Junction, Vermont, and that was about March 2016. And that was a very good, helpful move because they gave me great medical care and, um, and, and it was multidisciplinary. And I began to, I, I stopped getting worse. That was the key, but it still took me about five months to start getting better with the right medication. I cannot imagine um, living the way you had to live with that, the dream about the, the boa constrictor every, every morning when you woke up. I cannot imagine what that must have done to your psyche. Uh, just absolutely. Uh, I, what do you think kept you going? You know, I think I, I, you hear about people going through this and, and they take their own lives uh, because they can't take it anymore. What kept you going? Well, a couple things. Um, first off, I did have uh, passive suicidal ideations. And what the VA told me is that those um, visions of death that I had were um, me wanting to die, but not killing myself. I wanted somebody else or something else to actually kill me. And every day I wanted to die. I had no hope. I was hopeless. I never thought I would get better. The things that kept me going were, number one, my wife, who was fantastic. So she had just the right mix, the right touch of helping me with compassion, supporting me, but not doing everything. You know, making me do certain things that she thought I could do or needed to do. Very helpful. I had a battle buddy from the Army who cared. He kept working hard to get a hold of me. Even when I wouldn't return texts, emails, phone calls, he would get a hold of me through my wife, very concerned. And then he went to work trying to get me into this very good VA hospital in White River Junction, Vermont. And so he was key. My kids were key. I didn't want to let them down or die, you know, at a fairly young age. And then I would say, um, you know, my, my religious faith, that, you know, God gave me life and he doesn't want me to lose it. He doesn't want me to take it. He doesn't want me to die. He wants me to live and do, you know, great things, which I really believe. I think God gives every person a life and, he, and, and God wants us to do great things and accomplish big things with that precious life that he gives us. And then the last thing is perseverance. Um, you know, just having that and I was lucky to be in the Army and Ranger School and West Point and all that stuff. I think it built in me a perseverance that I would never give up. I'm going to keep on trying. I'm not going to quit. And I'm just going to never say die. I'm going to do everything I can. If the doctors tell me to do something, I'm going to do it. If they tell me to take pills, I take them. Um, if, they, if I have an appointment, I go. If they ask me a question, I answer honestly, no matter how stupid it seems. Um, and so I think perseverance was key to this as well. Awesome. And I will I will have to say, for those of you who might hear some background noise um, when Greg is talking, this is because he has perseverance because he had appointments at the VA this morning that went long. And he said, I can still make this work. I'm not going to let the Leader Transition Institute down. And he persevered and found the most quiet place he could at the VA. And he's here with us today. And so I really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think probably the average person is absolutely scared to death of is that if they were diagnosed with something in the mental health arena, that they would get hospitalized. What was the VA inpatient care? like? It was fantastic. Um, so when I went to the VA, March, 2016, um, the doctor did the, ask the normal questions. He said, are you suicidal? I said, no. Do you want to hurt yourself? No. Do you want to hurt others? No. And then he asked the question that has only been asked to me that one time. He said, do you have morbid thoughts of death or dying? And I said, yes, I do. I have terrible thoughts of death and dying, and I have them all the time. And they make me want to die. 
and they're very scary. And he said, well, tell me about them. And I told him about, you know, the, you know, getting murdered in jail, the invisible force, the boa constrictor. And he said, okay, this is very serious. These are called passive suicidal ideations, meaning you may not want to kill yourself, but you want somebody else or something else to take your life. You need to go into our inpatient facility. So I said, hey, that sounds good to me, doctor. I, I, I think I could use the help because I'm really in bad shape. And, um, and so I went in. It was very professional, very clean. I was in with about a dozen other veterans. <laughs> I, got, I had a um, really a dream team with um, doctors, nurses, therapists, pharmacologists, chaplain. And they gave me very good multidisciplinary care. Um, in fact, I liked it so much from Monday to Friday. I was asking them questions, getting smarter, becoming friends with them. But on the weekends when they would all go and there was only a nurse on duty, I would fall into depression because I didn't have my friends there. And, and they became actually quite concerned about my mental state. Um, I spent two weeks. I did uh, 14 rounds of uh, electroconvulsive therapy where they put nodes on your head and they shoot electricity into your brain to try to knock you out of depression. And then at the end of two weeks, they said, okay, we don't need to keep you anymore in the locked facility. You're not a threat to yourself or others, but we'd like you to stay in the hospital and, you know, maybe for a month and we'll give you a room, a dorm room where you can stay and sleep and then do intensive therapy all day long. And so I did the two weeks inpatient, the four weeks in the dorm. So I had six weeks living in, in the VA hospital and did un, underwent really good therapy. Um, the only thing they didn't do was to really experiment with my medication and try something newer that, that might be stronger. And when I got home, I fell back into really bad depression and my wife got really exasperated. And she said, we have to try something stronger. Got a hold of my doctor and said, what can we do to, because I was taking um, Lamictal and Latuda, which are both good medications, but they, they, they weren't strong enough for what I have. And so the doctor said, the next step is lithium, which is a natural salt from the earth. And um, he said, it has some negative side effects, but if you're willing to try it, I'll prescribe it. So we, we did, and I started taking lithium. And within three days, my symptoms went away. My depression went away. I had energy. I was interested. I, I started becoming like my own self. My psychosis went away. And, and that was in August of 2016. The next month, we moved to Florida to get the sunshine, the, uh, the warmth, the uh, brightness. And then I've been on my journey of recovery for going on eight years now. So what's the strategy? I, I, I love that. I'm disappointed that they didn't, you know, give you that strong. You seem like you had a really strong case of, of bipolar disorder that they wouldn't have like given you um, the, the best medicine that they had um, at the beginning, but they didn't. Um, so what is your strategy now for recovery? So my strategy now is, first of all, um, take medications. You know, these pills that the VA prescribes me are my friends. I take them every single day. I'm actually afraid not to take them because I'm worried I'll go back into mania. And even though mania feels great, you're sure to drop into depression, which I have many times, and I never want to go into depression again. And I feel I owe it to my family to, to keep taking the meds. But um, medication, they stabilize the brain chemistry. So that's number one. Number two, work with a therapist. A therapist is trained to talk to you and understand problems and help a person solve their problems, um, to identify what the triggers are to, to going to a bad place, to how to deal with and, 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 uh, and cope with triggers and agitation and anger. So, so a therapist is really key. Third is healthy living. So healthy diet, plenty of exercise, lots of sleep, water, um, you know, all those kind of things, healthy diets, exercise that keep you healthy. And those things are necessary, but not sufficient for a recovery that's built to last. For it to be built to last, 
you have to anchor those things into what I call the five P's. And the five P's are first purpose. You know, when, when I was in the military, I had a purpose. The, the army gave me my purpose. It was, you know, go do army stuff and be motivated and, you know, accomplish the army mission. But when I was a civilian, I didn't have a purpose. So I, it took me a couple of years to develop a really uh, a comprehensive purpose that motivated me and made me want to go forward. And my purpose is sharing my bipolar story to help stop the stigma, promote recovery and save lives. So that's my purpose. Second P is people. Surrounding yourself with a network of fun, happy, energetic people that make you feel happy. Third is place. Living in a place that lets you be with the people you like to do the things you like to do. And Florida is perfect for that. Fourth is perseverance. It's important because when you're on a journey of recovery, it never ends. You know, mental illness doesn't stop. It's a chronic disease that you have to manage your whole life. And so there will be setbacks. There will be pitfalls. There might be relapses, which are very dangerous. And so you have to have perseverance to keep going, to pick yourself up and keep moving forward. And then the final P is presence. And presence is the ability to get outside of my own head and think objectively about my thinking. And that's really important because oftentimes in my head, in most people's heads, we think thoughts that are not correct. They lead us astray. They take us down the wrong path. So if we can think objectively, we can solve these, these thoughts and, and live a healthier mental life. I love them. I, I love your five Ps. And we yeah. had a couple comments in, um, in the chat um, about that, that the, the five Ps are, are great. Um, do you have a call to action for us? Um, I, I'm going to talk about your book um, before we go. But what is your call to action for those of us who are watching or listening? Call to action is a couple of things. Normalize the conversation around mental health. And the way we really normalize it is we talk about it, we learn about it, we help people. And the way you help people is you learn and get educated and get trained on what are the basic symptoms of the most common mental illnesses and mental conditions. You know, so, you know, what do you have? You have PTSD. You have depression, you have bipolar disorder, you have traumatic brain injury, moral injury, um, survivor's guilt, et cetera, and there's more. What are the symptoms? What do they look like? And if you, are, if you recognize those either in yourself or in a friend, a family member, a work colleague, you sh we, should, we should go get a consultation. We should go get help with a mental health professional and, and be honest with them and tell them, hey, I'm having these issues. Um, but that's really important. And, and if, if I know, you know, Sally or John are having problems, I should go to them and say, hey, John, um, I'm noticing some odd behavior. Um, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I think this would be worthy of a consultation. Let's go see a mental health professional and I'll go with you. I will go and let's invite your spouse and your kids and your family members so that the doctor gets a really complete picture of you through collateral information. I think that's really, really important. And that's what they call peer support or having a battle buddy. The second big thing is um, stigma. Stigma is based on fear and ignorance, and there's no place for it. And stigma is the biggest barrier to people going and getting help because they're embarrassed, they're ashamed. So we need to do away with stigma and realize that these brain conditions are every bit as physically real as diabetes, heart disease, um, you know, cancer. And, you know, there's no stigma against somebody who has one of those diseases. And so neither should there be against someone who has a mental illness. And, if you, and a good example is if you go back 50 years uh, to the 1970s, breast cancer in women was stigmatized. Women were ashamed to talk about it. Families were embarrassed. And it wasn't until Betty Ford, the first lady, she started talking about it openly and educating the public. And, and she made a difference because now 50 years later, the culture has so changed that 
people with women with breast cancer are seen as heroic figures, warriors fighting this terrible disease. And, and that, that's how we should view people battling uh, mental, mental illness. And, you know, the shame if somebody doesn't go get help is it often will lead, if you don't get help, it'll lead to, it'll ruin your marriage, ruin your family, your career, your finances, often lead to homelessness, addiction, prison, and death. That's the choice you face if you don't get help. But if you do get help, I'm a good example, living a happy, healthy, purposeful life. So th those are the two choices. And it's up to each of us which way we want to go. I chose life and, and health, and I'm really happy I did. I, thank you. And, and I, I'm glad you did, too, because you're here to tell the story. Uh, and I think it, it's a tremendous story that people need to hear. I'm going to go back. We had a, a question earlier that I, we, we kind of addressed, but I really want to go back to it. Um, and because I, I feel that uh, sometimes uh, doctors, in, medical professionals in general, uh, they are very overscheduled and don't have a lot of time to to spend with their patients. How how do you feel about those healthcare providers that missed your diagnosis, that didn't get it right? Well, I think they did their best. I don't think they were trying to make a mistake or to misdiagnose me. So I think they tried, but they're caught in a system that does a bunch of things badly and leads the doctors to do things badly. Um, very short appointment times, often only seeing uh, one doctor instead of multiple doctors, um, not trying <laughs> to gain collateral information. So for example, <laughs> all the times I went in, the doctors only once invited my wife to come to the to the appointment only once. I mean, and she sees me every day, way more than the doctors do, and has a keen eyeball for my behavior. So I think that was really a mistake. Um, I think they didn't talk to my work colleagues and say, hey, how's General Martin doing? What, what is he normally like? And they would have found out, you know, high energy and all that. And now he's low energy. Hmm, that sounds like a so, sort of like a bipolar swing. Um, they, they just didn't routinely do the things that it's almost common sense to do. And they just were, were intimidated by my rank, by my success. And they couldn't see past it that, to the fact that I had a very sick brain and was really suffering from, you know, a serious uh, mental disease. That's sad. That said, that that the pe that the people that we're counting on us to lead, that the people who are caring for them might be afraid to say the things that they might say to somebody like me or Jose because they're intimidated by your rank. That's disappointing. Wow. So I'm going to put up. General Martin's website, uh, and because we're getting uh, to the end of our time together, and I really appreciate those of you who, are, who have hung out with us this whole time. Thank you so much for that. And those of you who will listen all the way to get to this point, at General Martin's website, you'll get information about his book. One of the things that I think is particularly cool about it is that there's a section called the book club, and it has a place where you can get questions to discuss um, with, with friends or other people and actually get some people together to discuss about the book, which I think is a great way of of raising this issue and continuing the discussion of this issue. And so if you'd like to learn more, General Martin has been really, I so I so appreciate all the time that you've spent with us. You've, you've shared so much in your story, but if you wanna learn more about General Martin's story and hear um, about his career and learn more about how the disease showed up in him, please uh, go and get his book. Um, at your favorite local bookseller. Uh, you'll find it there and online. So thank you for that. Uh, absolutely. And Andy, um, if I can just I, break in for just one second. Sure. That, uh, a you. number of, of people, uh, General Martin, have just uh, reached out to say thank you for, for what you shared, for being vulnerable with us this afternoon and for sharing your story. So Pender and Bruni, Trish, Teresa, uh, Don and uh, even your old friend Tiffany uh, Marchink, who you were on a podcast with recently. So, uh, just they're all very thankful for the story that you're sharing, and obviously, people are resonating with it. So, thank you for that. Any? 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. I want to end by asking you, um, sir, are there any uh, resources besides your book, which is, I think, full of excellent resources? Um, are there any other resources that you would recommend for people? Yes. Um, I would honestly say that um, my book, Bipolar General, is probably the, the first one I would go to. And that's don't take that from me. I mean, uh, professors are teaching in medical schools now. They're using the book because they think it's the best book they've ever read on mental illness and bipolar disorder. Um, num number two, there's another <clears throat> excellent book. It's called Brainstorm. And Brainstorm is written by Sarah Schley. And it is a, a, her story, her memoir of living with bipolar disorder type two. Mine was bipolar type one. Hers was two. Very, very good. And I'm on a team with Sarah and others. We're actually making a movie, and you can look it up. It's called brainstormthefilm.com. It is going to be a phenomenal film, and it'll be out next year on PBS as a documentary. And it'll be the most comprehensive film ever made on bipolar disorder. Um, the, the next thing I would really recommend, there's a company... Um, that has been working with the military veterans, the VA, hospitals, etc., for over 20 years. And you can find out about them by going to grithope.com. That's G-R-I-T-H-O-P-E.com. They are really, really good, professional, know what they're doing, uh, grithope.com. And then um, uh, lastly, there's a very innovative uh, professor I've been working with, she has a nonprofit and has come up with using a smartphone as a way to track and monitor um, moods, like with bipolar disorder, you know, depression, mania, and you can do it through your keyboard. And it's called bioeffect.com, B-I-A-A-F-F-E-C-T.com. And she's a professor at the University of Illinois, really super smart lady, um, is also a mathematician and a concert pianist and, you know, just as a biomedical engineer as well as a psychiatrist. But, uh, and her name is Alex Liao, but she is really something. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of that information with us and with everybody that's listening. I'm going to say thank you very much uh, for spending this time with us. I have to agree that you are um, probably doing your greatest mission. You served our country admirably, admirably and took care of lots of service members along the way, but you are going to take care of people across the world now um, in, in a much different way. So, so thank you for that. And thank you for your time today. Thank you, Greg. You're very welcome. I really appreciate the opportunity and keep doing the great work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you at the end of February with another session of Learn, Do, Grow, Repeat.